well. Amen. In the new church, one of the things that uh, I think that we're going to do, um, I haven't really talked to the, anybody about it. I just, I, just, I, just, I just feel the unction this morning. And uh, one of the things that I think we're going to do is put seatbelts on the chairs. <laughs> because sometimes the messages that the Lord gives us, or gives me, to give to you, uh, can feel, uh, you know, sometimes it, it would make you feel like you want to cut and run. Anybody ever, anybody ever felt that before? <laughs> Well, just buckle your little imaginary seatbelt, uh, because uh, I'm afraid he might have served one up today. But just be reminded this morning that before you get it, I get it. And uh, the Lord knows how to take his people to the woodshed. And uh, my intention here this morning is in no way to deliver any kind of a spanking or a whipping or any of that that's between you and God but what my job is this morning is to confront with the truth and God's word in John chapter 3 and verse 16 says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. How many of you think that's a great verse of Scripture? How many of you have applied that to your life? Amen? The problem is, it doesn't stop there. When you begin to study God's Word, and, and more than just read it, but you begin to study God's Word and look at what it's, what it's saying, he, he, yes, God loved the world so much that He gave His Son, but He's also commissioned us and, and, and really... Um, called us to take that love outside because we don't have a problem basically loving one another in this house. We don't have much trouble loving people in our families for the most part. If you knew my family. <laughs> we, we, we don't even do too bad with people that are nice to us. But I want to take a look this morning. My, my message title I, is, is kind of rough. It's love, to love or hate. To love or hate. That's as, that's as flashy as I could come up with. I tried. But I want for us to look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44 just for a moment. I'll have you stand in a little bit when I get to, the, to our text. I'll have you stand for that. But I, I want to just kick things off with verse 44 here of chapter 5. These, this is the Sermon on the Mount. A part of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is, is preaching this sermon, so uh, it's all written in red in the Bible. They're Jesus' words, and, 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 and Jesus' words, in my opinion, carry, carry some authority with them. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. See, this is what it says, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. How are we doing so far? Can you think of anything more contrary to human nature that, that even those of us who have said for years that we are followers of Christ have usually not followed him very far on this point? We struggle with it. It seems, loving, it, it, it seems loving anyone beyond our close circle of family and friends is difficult, but, but we can manage it if we try. 
I mean, we can sit around the Thanksgiving table even if somebody's there that we, we just have a mad on for. We, we can put up with them for that, you know, because we ain't going to miss out on the turkey and the mashed potatoes and pie. But this command is more difficult than just loving those people. It's more difficult than loving passing acquaintances and even complete strangers. Church, hang on to your seat right here because this command tells us to love those who actively seek to do us harm. It goes on. This command tells us to, to love those who have nothing but ill will for us and in reality will probably mock any attempt that we try and make to reconcile with them. So the reality is then that there's absolutely nothing in it for you and I, at least not on the surface. But church, we have to remember this isn't a passing suggestion that Jesus has given to us. He's not just saying, you know, I, I just think it'd be a great idea. You know, let me just suggest this to you. I think it'd be a great idea, you know, if, if you just loved those people that aren't quite that lovely. And we all know some of them. This is a command. It's an absolute direct command. He doesn't give you an option. If, do you want to be like Jesus? We're called to imitate him. We're called to be like Jesus. So if you are called this morning to be a representative of Jesus, to be an ambassador of the kingdom of, of God, of the kingdom of heaven, if you're called to walk in his likeness, we got to figure out, church, how to love people that don't love us back. Because if we're loving people just so that we get some warm fuzzy, if we're loving people so that we get something in return, we're loving for the wrong reason. Because the Bible said, while I was his enemy, Christ loved me and Christ died for me. When I was his enemy, when I was using his name in vain, because it just was catchy to talk about that, to say those words over the CB when I'm it, trucking down the high, it was just it just helped my sentences out. How many truck drivers know what I'm talking about? Church, we have a mandate from heaven. Let me, let, me, let me get you to turn to Matthew chapter 5 if you're not already there. Matthew chapter 5 and, and, and back up one verse to, to, to 43 and we're going to read through verse 48. As soon as you get there, would you just stand? my voice goes out on me about halfway through this, I'm just going to start using hand signals, all right? So you're going to have to be filled with the Holy Ghost to be able to interpret what I'm saying. <laughs> Amen. Lord Jesus, help us. Father God, you may have heard it, that it was said, Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Remember, he's saying that's what you heard. How many of you know we can hear wrong? I'll try this side. How many of you know that you can hear wrong? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Father, I pray, God, right now, Lord, that you'd anoint this vessel of clay. 
God, anoint this preacher this morning to deliver and to declare your word, the truth of your word, O oh God. And I pray, Lord, that you would help your anointing, that your anointing would be on your people today to receive uh, this word from your Holy Spirit. I pray, God, that this preacher would decrease, Lord, that you'd increase in me. And so, God, I thank you for it. I pray you bless it. I pray that it changes and touches lives. I pray today that people are set free by the, by the power of your word, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Spirit. I pray, God, people are healed right in the midst of this service this morning. I pray for those folks watching this morning over the internet that somehow your Holy Spirit will go through these airwaves or whatever kind of waves they carry the internet out there. I pray, God, that, you, that it would get into their homes and their lives and transform them and change them, Lord, because they've been listening to your word today. And I thank you for it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. And amen. You may be seated. Loving an enemy, church, is difficult at best. I can remember growing up, I never, I would never have considered myself to be uh, racist, to be one that uh, didn't care for people of other ethnic backgrounds. I was sitting in my chair reading the other day, and, and I looked at my dog. If you've ever seen my dog, my dog's a blue healer, and she's got spots on her that are black. She's got spots on her that are brown. She's got spots on her that are white. she got all different kinds of spots all over her. And I got to thinking about that, and I, I, my, my, my daughter has a, has a dog that's all black. She has one that's white and one that's brown, colored. And I thought, you know, it's kind of funny that animals don't seem to be bothered by what color each other is. And I thought, you know, I don't have a problem with, 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 with colored people, whether they're black or brown or red or green or Yellow, doesn't matter. We're all created in the image of God. We're all created in His likeness. And then the Lord reminded me, and I honestly had to repent, because I went to Pearl Harbor. And I had no problem with walking into that place with the people that I was walking in there with. But when I came out the other side, I was mad. I was angry. I wanted to just grab one and punch him right in the throat. In fact, all of them. Because of what happened and what they did to our troops, to our servicemen. And the Lord reminded me of that. And to some degree, I've been carrying that bitterness in my spirit for all, these, all those years. And I had to repent of it. Because if I can't love those folks that did that, if I can't love the guy that did that, that ordered the hit, that ordered the attack, then I don't love like Jesus loves. And we're called to get, uh, we're, we're, the, we, I got to remind us this morning that the Bible says I'm no longer my own. I've been bought with a price. Amen? I don't, have, I don't have the authority in myself to make those decisions. I'm supposed to read God's Word. Let God's Word get inside of me and change me and compel me to live my life after the mandate that Jesus Christ set and the example that He set. So by loving and praying for our enemies, we prove our relationship with our Father. And we show His love in an unlovely world and overcome evil with good. Isn't that the plan? Isn't that the purpose that God has put us here for? And so by telling us to not retaliate against personal injustices, Jesus here keeps us from taking the law into our own hands. How many of you have wanted to do that? <laughs> Law, boy, I tell you one thing, I'm going to lay hands on you three ways, long, hard, and continuously. <laughs> hey, Amen. I mean, boy, I'll tell you, I'll slap, I'll slap happy right into you. <laughs> I 
Apparently I'm not the, apparently I'm not the only one. <laughs> You're in good company this morning. We're not to retaliate. You remember, you remember the old TV program, um, Highway to Heaven? Well, God bless Hulu. Because we found Highway to Heaven and was watching that thing yesterday. And this biker, was it a biker guy? I don't know, maybe some, a bar fight or something. This guy hauls off and hits Michael Land and Jonathan right in the mouth. And Jonathan doesn't even, you know, because I mean, he's an angel, right? And so he just took the punch, you know, and, and then he does this. <laughs> Turned the other chair, and the guy smacked him again. The guy's looking at him like, dude, you should be on the ground. He's like, I turned the other cheek. And I thought, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Isn't that the way we're supposed to re respond? This It also keeps our focus on him and, and not on our own rights. How many of you have said, well, I have rights. I'm telling you, this, uh, this isn't. I knew this wasn't going to be pretty this morning, but I'm just putting it out there. How many of us have said, well, I have my rights? Well, when you gave your life to Jesus, you've surrendered all of your rights. You are no longer your own, the Bible says. You've been bought with a price. How am I doing? Isn't this fun? See, in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, it says, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, he says. And so the Pharisees, in their broad interpretation sometimes of the word, that they, 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 they interpreted Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18 as teaching that they should love only those who love in return. As long as everybody's loving me, I don't have a problem loving you back. But the moment you cross me, the moment you stand in opposition to, to what, I'm, what I'm saying and what I'm thinking. See, the, the neighbor here refers to someone of the same nationality and the same faith. And so while no Bible verses explicitly say hate your enemies, the Pharisees may have reinterpreted some of the Old Testament passages about hatred for God's enemies. Want me to prove it to you? Good, I will. Psalm chapter 139, verse 19 through 22. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. I do, do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. So we ought to just hate everybody that's our enemy. Look at Psalm 140, starting in verse 8. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not further his wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. As for the head of those who surround me, let the evil of their lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not a slanderer be established in earth. Let evil hunt the violent man to overthrow him. Wow. Wow. Somebody's got an attitude. <laughs> Going back to verse 43 of our original text, Jesus made the statement, you have heard that it was said. This is some of where what they heard is coming from. From the Pharisees who have reinterpreted some of those things. But Jesus goes on to say, I, I say, love your enemies. Pray for those that persecute you. If you can do that, you truly show that Jesus is the Lord of your life. He's the Lord of your life. Can I just interject this this morning for just for free? If, if Jesus is not Lord of all, in your life, he ain't Lord at all. 
He has to be the Lord of all. Jesus explained to his disciples that they must live by a higher standard than what the world expects. I mean, if you know, the Bible says that we're to be in the world, but not of the world. The world ought to be able to see something different about your, your character and your, your, the way you walk, the way you, uh, the way you carry on in, in, in business and in, in school and, and in, in your workplace. The world ought to be able to see there's, there's something different about you. When you've gone away for a long time and you come back, maybe to your hometown like I did, and people that knew you 40, 50 years ago come across your path and all of a sudden they're like, hmm, something different. What, what happened to you? I'd like to say I found Jesus, but he wasn't lost. I was. He found me. And I surrendered my life to Jesus and I ain't never been the same since. Do I still struggle? I do still struggle. Do I still have battles? I have battles every day. But I know in whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep me against that day. That's what his word says. We have to live by a higher standard. In, in our men's group the other night, we were talking about some things, and, and one of the things is that we talked about was that we are called, church, as men and, 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 and as women, and especially as leadership, that we are to rise above. We're to be above. We're, we're, we're not to, you know, if it, even, if it even looks bad, we aren't supposed to do it. We're to flee the very appearance of evil. Evil has become sociably okay today it's become sociably okay everybody's doing it no not everybody not everybody i'm praying that some of us in this room today would say yeah i'm not doing that i'm not doing that i i know who i've believed in and i'm i'm persuaded he he could keep me against that day people who have experienced the love of god understand what it means to be loved undeservedly listen i don't know about the rest of you but if you know this pastor i'm the least qualified guy to stand in this pulpit and i got quiet are you rethinking your choice of church I'm the least qualified guy to be in this pulpit because I've got a past church that is colorful, mostly black. It's not good. I'm not bragging about my past because of my past. I'm bragging about my past being redeemed by the Savior and King, Lord Jesus. I'm telling you, I've been washed in the blood. I know who I have believed. I know what it means to be forgiven and uh, uh, undeservedly. I don't deserve it. I don't know a lot about some of you in here, but I know this. You didn't deserve it either. Not one of us deserve it. But yet he loves us anyway. Because see, at church, it's only with the help of the Holy Spirit that we can love and pray for those that seek to do us harm. There are people that are actively seeking to do you and I harm. There are people that are actively seeking. There are people praying against this church this morning. There are people that are gathered together and they're praying that God would be stopped. That evil would be released. I'm saying, I know who I, I know whose I am. And I know that his word says, he's, my daddy's bigger than your daddy. Huh? My daddy can whoop your daddy all daggum day long. How I many of you know when daddy shows up, it's going to be okay? We just slip behind dad and let it, go ahead, dad. 
Romans 12 and 14 through 21 says, bless those who persecute you just in case, you you know, just bless those that persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Ooh. I'll just stop and let that sink in just for a minute. I ain't even going to ask that. (laughs) Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Did you catch that little three-letter word in there? All men? He's talking about the ones that you don't like. He's talking about the ones that are coming after you. He's talking about the ones that spitefully use you and persecute you and speak all manner of evil against you. With all men, live peaceable. Beloved, do not avenge yourself. Well, this is just mean this morning, isn't it? Do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy's hungry... Oh, man. Really? Are you kidding me? If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. But do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the mandate of the church. The love of God will win every day, every time. These verses summarize the core of the Christian living. If we love someone the way Christ loves us, we will be willing to forgive. How willing are we to forgive? We've been talking about it a lot on on Wednesday night, about forgiveness and salvation and those kinds of things. And and, and, and church, we, we have to forgive whether we really want to or not. Because with the, you'll be forgiven the way you forgive, the Bible says. So we got to learn how to forgive people. If we've experienced the grace of God, you will want to pass it on to others. Isn't that true? And remember, grace is undeserved favor. His grace is undeserved favor. Favor. And so by giving the enemy a drink, you're not excusing his misdeeds. We, we're, we're recognizing him. We're, we're forgiving him. We're loving him in spite of his sin, just as Christ did for us. Isn't that amazing? Forgiveness. <laughs> Forgiveness involves two different things. Number one, forgiveness involves your, your, your attitude. Anybody, anybody have trouble sometimes with their attitude? Some of us are going, me. Anybody have trouble with your attitude? Forgiveness involves both attitudes and actions. Attitudes and actions. So if you find it difficult to feel forgiving towards someone that's hurt you, try responding with some kind action. Kindness will carry you a long way. Kindness is good for you. Kindness may be the very tool that tears the wall down between you and somebody that has odd against you or that you have maybe an attitude against. If it's appropriate, tell the person that you'd like to heal your relationship. We ought to work on that, church. We as a men's group, on Friday night, we're challenged 
were challenged by God's Word to make some phone calls. Maybe to our sons and our daughters for our actions in the past. Say, hey, I really blew it. Would you forgive me? Because if it's not forgiven, they'll just carry it on to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation if it doesn't get taken care of. And we have to take care of it, men. We got we to gotta man up. We got to man up. How about lending a helping hand? If appropriate, tell the person that you'd like to heal your relationship. Lend a helping hand. Send them some kind of a gift, maybe. Smile at somebody. How many of you know smiles will tear down walls? A smile will tear down walls. If it's a dark place, smiles will light up the room. Many times you'll discover that right actions lead to right feelings. Right actions lead to right feelings. Jesus defined our enemies as those who curse us, hate us, and exploit us selfishly. And since Christian love, by the way, Christian love is an act of the will. Amen? It's an act of the will. You will to love. It's, it's an act of the will. It's not simply an emotion that I get all warm and fuzzy inside. It, it, the, the Lord has the right to command us to love our enemies. It's His right. It's His prerogative. Well, how, why does He have that, Pastor? I'll tell you why. Because in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, He says he, that He loved us when we were still His enemies. When you were spouting off all kind of stuff, doing all kind of stupid things, acting all stupid, acting like a devil... He loved you then. He loved you then. And we might show this love by blessing those that curse us, by doing good to them, and, and by praying for them. And, and when we pray for our enemies, we find it easier to love them. It, 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 prayer takes the poison out of your attitude. Jesus gives several reasons for this admonition. This kind of love, number one, is a mark of maturity. Remember in the scripture when I, when I read right at the end of our passage that it, we're called to be perfect, even as he is perfect? We're not ta- I'm not talking about flawless. That word perfect there is not talking about without any imperfection. It's not talking about you know, being perfect as we think of the word perfect. That word perfect is talking about being mature by growing up into Christ. And that's what we've been called to do. It love, the ability to love one another, love our enemies, love those that persecute us and hate us and all those things. It, it's, just, it's a mark of maturity and it proves that we are the, son, the sons of the Father and not just little children. We're growing up in, in some of these areas in our life. So number one, it's, love is a mark of maturity. And number two, love is godlike. It's godlike. You want to practice the things that God does? Then love. That's what he did. God is love. The Father shares his good things with those who oppose him. How many of you, after you got saved, how many of you have looked back over your life at time after time after time after time, when you know you probably should be dead. But God. But God. Because He knew you then. He loved you then. He was with you then. When we didn't want nothing to do with him then, he was still there. His Holy Spirit ever so gently, I believe, was tugging at us. He's, he's, he's not rude. He's not, you know, he enforcing himself on you. 
Matthew 5.45 suggests that our love creates a climate, a climate of blessing that make it easy to win our enemies and to, and to make them our friends. Love does that. Love changes everything. Love. Love's good. Love's a, a really, really good thing. Love is like the sunshine and the rain, and the Father sends those things to us graciously. And what happens when when the sunshine and the rain starts happening, and it begins to to warm the soil of the earth, and all of a sudden, those little yellow flowers start popping up everywhere. And and all that, because it produces growth, it produces life. So, love is like sunshine and rain, and and it will cause things to grow. Number three, love is a testimony to others. What you do, what do you do more than others? That's a good question. And God expects you and I to live on a much higher plane than those lost people in the world who return good for good and evil for evil. We're to love people regardless. It's, it's, it's against our culture. I admit that. It's against the culture of this world. Where do we listen, man? We return. You want you want to fight? All right, I'm not going to just stand. I'm because I'm going to return punch for punch. But we're called to a different standard. This world is not my home. I'm a sojourner. I'm just passing through here. I don't have to be dictated to by the mandates of the culture that we live in. Sex outside of marriage is not permissible in the kingdom of God. Well, everybody's doing it. Nope, not everybody. Because God's word says don't do it. Save yourself until you're married. That's God's word. I'm not just being, I'm not trying to be ugly this morning. I'm just telling you that if you want to live a life that is blessed by God, we're going to have to line up with God's word. You can still love your girlfriend or love your boyfriend, your fiance or whatever you, however it is, you can, you can still love them without jumping in the sack. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. There's a reason, there's reasons that God's called us to purity. There's a reason that some of us are going without food right now, going without things like coffee right now. Why? Because we're bringing this pile of flesh into submission to the Lord. Listen, flesh, you've been dictating to me long enough that I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to take over. We have to get control of our flesh. As Christians, we need to return good for evil as an investment of love. Let me just throw this in here right now, too. By loving someone that's doing stupid stuff and acting all crazy does not have to mean that you condone their actions. I'm not saying that. You have to look beyond their action and love that person. Do we understand that this morning? Because I don't want you to say, well, pastor said we're just supposed to love everybody and what they do. I didn't say love everybody and what they do. Love them, not what they do. So the word perfect, again, simply means, uh, uh, it doesn't, does not imply sinlessly perfect because the reality is that's impossible for us. But it does suggest completeness. It suggests completeness. It suggests maturity. Some young people are mature at 17 and 18 years old. And some adults are still immature at 70 and 75. It's just the truth. It's just the reality. Why? Because they've chosen not to walk with the Lord, not to, to, to challenge themselves. Church, we have to challenge ourselves. 
I'm not going to be at your house on Monday. And I'm not going to be there on Tuesday. To challenge you, to get in your word, to pray and to seek God. I'm not going to be there to present these kinds of hard challenges. But the Holy Ghost is going to be there if you'll just spend some time with him and let him begin to speak into your life. If you'll just begin to listen to what he has to say. We are to be complete in him. And to grow into maturity. The Father loves His enemies and seeks to make them His children. And we ought to be doing the same thing. We ought to be assisting Him in that process. Jesus concluded this section by saying, Be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And His message here demonstrated His righteous standard. For God Himself truly is the standard of righteousness. You want to know what standard, what, what righteousness looks like? Get in your Bible and begin to read about Jesus. And begin to read about God. Begin to read how, how, how to live your life. Most sermons that are preached never make it out of the parking lot. So you're going to forget probably 90 to 95% of what you've heard here this morning if you don't on purpose meditate and bring it to your mind and ask God by His Holy Spirit, reveal to me what you're trying to tell me through the, God's Word, through these messages. If these individuals are to be righteous, if we are to be righteous individuals, we have to be as God is, perfect or mature and holy. Murder, lust, hate, deception, uh, you know, illicit behavior, all that kind of stuff, and retaliation, those kinds of things do not characterize God. They do not characterize God. How many, let me just tell you something that maybe help you out this morning. This pastor is still working on those areas in my life. I'm still trying to get mature in Christ. I'm still trying to grow up in God. I don't do it right all the time. My wife and I have discussions because sometimes I blow it. Because sometimes I'm not the man of God that I'm supposed to be, and I do stupid stuff. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to help you out this morning. You're not the only one. He did not listen. Murder, hate, lust. Deception, retaliation, do not characterize God. He did not, listen to me church, He did not lower His standard to accommodate you and I. He, he raised the bar high. And He said, this is the mark. You know, we lower the basketball hoop down so little people can can play basketball, you know, and, and that might be great for somebody in the first grade, but hey, come on. They need to learn how to shoot that ball 10 feet in the air because when they get in school, the ball is going to be shot 10 feet in the air. We need to quit making it necessarily easier on people. Just listen, giving out trophies because you were there, that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. If you didn't win, guess what? You ain't getting a trophy. <laughs> That's terrible. I'm going to throw my water down. Oh, come home and tell mom and dad, I didn't even get a trophy. Well, suck it up, buttercup. Try a little harder. How many practices did you miss? How much time did you spend, spend working on your skill and on, on, you know, are you being a team player? God didn't lower his standards to accommodate you and I. He put forth his absolute holiness as the standard. If you want a trophy, win the game. You don't get a thank you trophy just because you showed up. 
There's an incentive. The reason why trophies were, were, begin, were handed out in the first place was twofold. Number one, to, to show as, a, as, a, as a, uh, uh, some kind of a, what, a, a, a monument or whatever you want to call it, a trophy, hello, that your team won. But also, if you don't get the trophy, it encourages you or it ought to encourage you to try harder. Amen. To try harder. You and I are never going to be able to meet perfectly the standard that we're called to. But a person who's, who by faith trusts in God enjoys his righteousness being reproduced in your life. If you'll walk with God, if you'll get in His presence, if you'll walk with Him every day, you'll begin to see His righteousness begin to be reproduced in your life. The possibility of only those who give themselves fully to God because only He or rather this is possible only uh, for those that give themselves fully to God because only He can deliver you and I from natural selfishness. We have to trust the Holy Spirit to help us to show love to those who we may not feel love for. They're going to be out there. They're going to, they're, you're going to be confronted by them this week. Some of us next month are going to get on an airplane and, and the, the likelihood of someone not being nice is probably pretty high. <laughs> Who are we going to represent? Who are you going to represent? We have to trust that He will help us, that the Holy Spirit will help us to show love for those for whom we may not feel love so here we go again how can we be perfect we're called to be perfect in 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 character in this life we we cannot be flawless but we can acquire to be uh, or rather aspire to be as much like christ as possible In holiness, in character and in holiness. In holiness, like the Pharisees, we are to separate ourselves from the world's sinful values. But unlike the Pharisees, we are to be devoted to God's desire rather than our own and carry His love and mercy into the world. That's our job. That's our mandate. Number three. Number one, in character. Number two, in holiness. Number three, in maturity. We can't achieve Christ-like character and, and holy living all at once. We have to grow toward maturity and wholeness. <laughs> I, I, I remember my, my sister Sandy had uh, her first child, and sometimes she tried to get ahead of things a little bit, and she was, came to the house, and, and she had her, ch her first child with her, and and, and she, I mean, it was, she was just a tiny little, tiny little thing. And she says, oh, yeah, she can already walk. I said, well, let me see her. And, and I just went. <laughs> I said, she doesn't do it very good. <laughs> yeah, that was mean, but there's a process called maturity. Babies, when they're first born, can't walk. we got to help them along. We stuff a, a bottle in their mouth and let them drink milk to be nourished. And as they grow up, we grind food up and give it to them and let their little bodies begin to mature and process those kinds of things. And when they get big and strong like me, I don't have to have my food ground up anymore bless the lord 
There's a maturity process that's taken place. We cannot achieve Christ-like character by, and holy living all at once. It, it, we have to grow towards it. Just as we expect different behavior from a baby, a child, a teenager, and an adult, so God expects believers' behavior, uh, uh, different behavior from us, depending on our stage or our spiritual development. If you've been in church for 40 years, you ought to be growing in the things of God. If you just now memorize John 3.16 and you've been in church for 30 years, shame on you. You need to mature. So in character, in holiness, in maturity, and in love, we can seek to love others as, as completely as God loves us. We can be perfect if, if our behavior is appropriate for our maturity level. Perfect yet with much room to grow. How many of you in that boat right there? John and Kathy, you guys can come. Our tendency to sin must never deter us from striving to be more Christ-like. Our tendencies to sin must never deter us from striving to be Christ-like. Anybody ever blown it really, really bad and you just like, I'm just going to give up. I just, I'm giving up. That's exactly what the enemy wants you to do. And it's exactly contrary to what the Lord wants you to do. The Lord wants you to get before him and repent. The Lord wants for you to confess your sin and allow him to come in and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Christ calls us as disciples to excel, to rise above mediocrity, and to mature in every area to become like Him. Those who strive to be perfect will one day be perfect, even as Christ is perfect. Not on this earth, but when we get to heaven. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Let me close with this passage in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be but we know that when he is revealed we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure how in the world Am I ever going to do that, Pastor? Well, let me just say to you this morning that He has revealed Himself in our spirits this morning. He's revealed Himself in, in, in our worship. He's revealed Himself today in our hearts. And today, if you do me a kind favor and bow your heads, begin to pray. If you know Jesus, Pray for somebody that might not. It all starts at the foot of the cross. It all starts with you surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. What do you mean? Well, I already told you that it says in John 3, 16 that God's love was so strong for the world that He sent His only begotten Son so that we wouldn't perish, but we could have everlasting life. Sin caused a great chasm between a holy and a righteous God and sinful human life like you and I. And Jesus went to the cross and he bridged the gap. He bridged the gap between the righteousness of God and the sinfulness of his people. The Bible says that we must be born again. What does that mean? Well, it means that there's got to come a rebirth. No, you can't be physically reborn again but spiritually you can 
how that happens is you simply confess that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. I mean, it's literally that simple. God, I, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I recognize that I've never accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. But today, I want to invite you to come into my heart and to be the Lord of my life forever and ever. Amen. That's all there really is to it, church. And so if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, if you've never committed your life to Jesus, but today you recognize that there's been a love different than anything I've ever experienced, that the love of God has manifested in my heart, and today I just, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to surrender. I want to make sure that one of these days I'm going to make heaven my home. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, I've never done that. I've never accepted the Lord, but I want to today. I want you to raise your hand this morning. Raise your hand. I want to pray with you. If you're here at all and want to get saved, I want to pray with you. Anybody at all, Preacher, that's me. Maybe, maybe you accepted the Lord. Maybe life got in the way and you've walked away from the Lord, you just, you know, it wasn't a grad, it wasn't an uh, immediate thing, it was a gradual, and the next thing you know, you're way off course, and you know, you're just adrift at sea. You say, man, I, I need to get back into the safety of the harbor. I need to get back under the, the covering of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Today you want to recommit your life to Jesus. If that's you, raise your hand. I'm going to pray with you. I see your hand, young man. You put it down. Somebody else say, preacher, that's me. Yes, I see you guys in the back. I see you. Yes, sir, I see you in the front. Somebody else, preacher, that's me. Preacher, that's me. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Listen to me. God's moving in this house this morning. Don't miss it. Don't miss the move of God. If you want to recommit your life to Jesus, just join the rest of them that have already raised their hand. Raise your hand and say, yep, I'm, I'm on that. But I see your hand, sir. You can put it down. Somebody else, preacher, that's me. I ain't leaving this house today unless I know that I'm saved. Anybody else before I move on? Prayer team, I need people to come and pray with me. Listen, if you raised your hand, I want you to come right now. Meet me right here in front of this church. Come on, church.